listening to a resource from Jambrew Anglican Church. Well, let me lead us in prayer. Our loving Father, thank you so much that you speak to us and that right now you're going to do that by your Holy Spirit as we look at your word, the Bible. And we thank you now for the book of Ephesians and all that you've taught us over the last nine weeks. Uh, And we pray that today you would give us a great insight into your scriptures and into your wonderful work in this world, we pray in in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, even though there's great value in classroom and lecture room learning, it seems that some of the most important lessons in life are actually caught, not taught. I think that's one of the reasons that we still train our chippies and our sparkies and our doctors through apprenticeships and traineeships and internships. And it's also the reason that church ministers benefit so much from a ministry apprenticeship. Uh, When I was 24 years old, my church minister asked Mandy and me if uh, we would meet with him one night after church. And his first words as we sat down in his office at the end of church were, Are you feeling comfortable? Because I'm about to make you feel uncomfortable. That's quite a, quite a way to start, and I still remember it to this day, half a lifetime ago. He then said to me, would I like to leave my job and begin a ministry apprenticeship at that church? And now, I loved my job and uh, in, enjoyed doing that, but I also knew that ever since the day I finished at school, I, I pretty much soon after realised that what I wanted to do in life was to be a full-time minister of the gospel, to be a, to be a guy who could do youth group and do the kind of thing I'm doing right now. And so as Mandy and I finished up with that meeting and we walked back to the car, it was kind of like a no-brainer. We just knew that this was going to be the thing that we would do, and so I did. Um, and so for the next two years, I joined the staff at the church as an apprentice minister. And it was great. Uh, I got to be a part of the action. I didn't really know much about what was happening, (laughs) but I was around a bunch of people that did. And as I watched them, I learned. Uh, I, the apprentice, and all the master craftsmen and craftswomen who were doing the leadership in the local church. They let me try some all new ministries. They pushed me out of my comfort zone. But above all, they let me watch what they were doing and listen to what they were doing. Ministry was caught, not taught. So those two years, I did an apprenticeship called an MTS apprenticeship. And you've heard me use those three letters before. MTS stands for the Ministry Training Strategy. And it's an organisation I'm still very involved with. Um, And uh, there's a conference coming up in a couple of weeks' time, the MTS Recruit Conference, uh, that I'm helping uh, behind the scenes some of that, which now has become global. We've got people from Africa, from Japan, all sorts of people all around the world who are participating in it, which is lots of fun. I've also spoken with our wardens and our parish council, and I think I might have even mentioned it in our annual general meeting. I can't remember. But we would love to have our own ministry apprentice in the next year or two as well. And uh, we're praying that the Lord would raise up the right person who might be able to join us and uh, do and let, allow me and the people in our team to, to train him or her up in the same sort of way that I did. Um, and it'd be great. Now, what's all that got to do with Ephesians? Well, the reason I'm telling you this is that the the next chunk of the book of Ephesians, from chapters 3, verses 14 to 21, we get to sit at the feet of a master of the faith. I don't think that's how I'm supposed to spell feet. That was my typo there. Anyway, F-double-E-T. My fault, my bad. Autocorrect. Uh, sitting at the feet, of, which is a great feat in itself. We are sitting at the feet of a master of the faith. Paul is about to pray. And we are going to sit at his feet and we're going to catch from what he's doing a glimpse at the master kneeling before his Lord. And it's going to be awesome. And we are going, by, by sitting there and listening and watching, so to speak, we will be able to, to catch what it means to pray in a really powerful way. So with that in mind, I'm now going to read out to us from Ephesians chapter 3, verses, four, uh, verses 14 to 21. And as I do so, I want you to see if you can spot some key words. See if you can see thing, things in there that, that seem to be bigger issues that keep praying about as he's going through this section. Ephesians 3. 14 to 21. Let me read it to you. And when I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. 
I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. That's Paul's prayer. It's really quite something, isn't it? And I wonder if you noticed any key words or key ideas that appeared a few times. Why don't you yell a few out? What are some key words that popped up a few times? The superabundance of everything. Oh, yes, yeah, superabundance of everything. Yeah, pretty much. That's right. It's like, whoa, so much. What else? Any particular words that appear more than once or ideas that appear more than once? Complete? Yeah. What else? Love appeared a few times. Did you notice that? It's kind of a key theme. Strong. Yes, yeah, strong. And sort of related to that is power. So power and strength. And then right near the end, it talks a few times about glory. So there's a, there, I could sit down now, but I won't. But, um, uh, but they are the kind of concepts and ideas that we're going to explore in just a moment. These are the things that he wants to pray about. And I wonder whether or not they are the things that you'd naturally would expect him to be praying about. Is he'd say, well, I, I'm kind of got a caricature of what I think Paul is like and what he would talk to God about. Would he talk in that way? Uh, would he say those sorts of things? Would he ask for those sorts of things? Would he mention those sorts of things? Well, that's a good question. Let's examine it a bit more. And he kicks off again, as I mentioned before, in verse 14. He says, when I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father. He says, when I think of all this. Hmm, sounds a little bit familiar. It feels like we've actually heard him say, when I think of all this before. And he did, back in verse 1. When I think of all this. You remember last week what happened? He started to say, when I think of all this, and he's ready to launch into the prayer that we're looking at tonight. But he kind of, his mind went, whoa, because he said, when I think of all this, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the benefit of you Gentiles. And he just got kind of the wheels spun. He couldn't get any more. He just had to stop and say, what a mind-blowing thing it is that Gentiles would be with the Jews. Uh, you, you get those moments where you just have to stop and pinch yourself and say, that's right, this is weird. I, I, I get it a few times with all this COVID stuff. You're sort of going through life and then you suddenly think, that's right, we've got this pandemic. Oh, yeah, of course. And you say, that's... It was for him, it's like he's going on and said, that's right, the Gentiles are at the same level as the Jews. He was about to say some stuff and then he was interrupted by the wow... And after 13 verses, he gets back to the point. What is, the, what, what is all of the stuff that he's talking about? The, the when I think of all this. Well, I think it's what we saw the chapter before. For Christ, verse 14. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. All the people who love Jesus as their Lord are now brought together as one, whether they grew up as a Jew or whether they joined the party late as a Gentile. doesn't matter. And all of this stuff is mind-blowing for Paul. He, he, he wants to start praying, but he just got to go, whoa, which is what we saw last week. But now this is what drives him to his knees. God's amazing plan drives Paul to pray. God's amazing plan drives Paul to pray. What is it that drives you to pray? What makes you pray? What gets you on your knees? 
Often it's when we're in a time of crisis that people will pray. A good mate of mine used to be a chaplain with the 3 RAR Parachute Battalion Group. And he said to me, when you're about to jump out of a plane in a moonless night with a heavy pack strapped to your legs, there are no atheists. Even the hardest paratroopers would turn to him and say, Padre, would you pray for me? (laughs) Maybe you've had a crisis that's brought you to your knees. Or maybe it's being overwhelmed with God's creation. I thought that after the, watching the birth of three babies being born, my first three kids, that I reckon I'd be able to hold it together for the fourth one. I'll be fine with this. But no, when Hugo popped out, whee, oh, my tears welled up and my lips are sort of moving and my, all these things happened. I, I was amazed again to meet my second son, my fourth child. Oh. And it was emotional, but it was emotional to meet him. But, but it was again a wonder that God would, do, would knit together a child in the mother's womb. And here he is. It's a wonder of creation. It was a, it was a wonder of creation. That, and I've I, I got to say that if you are, that, that, that hardened atheists must work really, really hard to say there is no God when they're at the birth of a child, surely. But it's not fear and it's not wonder at creation that has led Paul to pray here. What he's praying, what's led him to pray, is God's amazing grace. He is amazed that God would include those stinky Gentiles. That's me and you, you know. But that he'd include us in there with the Jews, the pure Jews, the holy Jews. But now these stinky Gentiles are in there in the club as well. And they're equal with me, the, gen- the Jew, he's saying to himself. And he's like, wow, my God is so big. There's nothing my God cannot do. He is amazed and it drives him to pray. But to whom does he pray? Well, let's have a look again at verse 14. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and I pray to the Father. He prays to God the Father. Paul prays to God the Father. I don't think that should come as a great surprise, but it is a fairly clear example of what it is that Christians should be doing as we pray, who it is that we should be praying for. This is the normal way. The normal way is for Christians to pray to the Father. In the name of the Son, in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a, it's a Trinitarian prayer. Three persons are all involved in the prayer thing. But the normal way is for us to talk to the Father. Now, you can still talk to Jesus. Go for it, for sure. It's a great thing to pray to Jesus, and we see that happening in the New Testament as well. We don't actually see any examples in the New Testament of where anyone prays to the Holy Spirit. But given that he is a person, uh, it seems to be that there is warrant for that, I think. But the point is, he is praying now to the Father. And here's something he prays about the Father. He says, verse 15, The Father, who is the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. Why would he talk to him as, why would he refer to God the Father as being the creator? Why would he talk about that? Why, Why didn't he say... I pray to God the Father who is the ruler of all things or or is the judge of all people or or is the saviour of the world or or, or why did he choose to use the word creation? Well, I think that it's because that God's creation is such a powerful testament to his existence and his character. Uh, You know, you read in Psalm 19... The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day they continue to speak. Night after night they make him known. God's creation is such a powerful testament to his existence. I was chatting with a person a little while ago, and I wasn't quite sure if they were an atheist or whether they were just sort of, you know, umming and ahhing a bit about it all. And I was thinking, where do I go next with this? And I think the next time I chat with this person, I reckon it might well be something to do with God's creation. It's like, where do you reckon this all came from? Where do you reckon you came from? Like, do you really think that, that a sludge could somehow have a lightning strike and then wham, here we go, just by a fluke? What are the chances of that? Really? 
And then when we get further, it's like, well, if that's the case, if there's a creation, then you've got to say there's a creator, and then it gives us something to work with. But the other thing is that because God is a creator, it also gives him the right to rule. God's creation act gives him the right to rule. Uh, when you make something, you've got a, you've got an, op- you, you, you can sort of control it. It's yours, and you create the universe if that's what you happen to do. It's yours. You've got a right to create it, and it's right that your creation should acknowledge you as the creator. God's creation act gives him the right to rule, but it also means that he has the power to save us. And it means that when it comes to Judgment Day, it's also too late to be reconciled to him. Because we read in Romans 1.20, For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Doesn't get clearer than that, does it? Get to heaven and and someone says... Oh, I didn't believe that you existed. It's like, ever have a look at the, ever go to a national park? Really? But there's more to this verse than meets the eye. Our New Living Translation, which is what we use in our church, at the end of this verse, verse 15, there's a little tiny A at the end, or there's a footnote or something that says at the bottom of the Bibles, it says, or from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. You might think, well, that's a pretty different translation to the other one. Well, what's in the footnote there is actually a more literal translation of the original Greek. Uh, It basically means the same thing, that God is the creator. He's the one that every family gets its name from. But when you look at that footnote, that more literal translation, it makes a bit more sense of the idea of God being the Father. You see that there? If God is the Father from whom every family everywhere takes its name, it gives it that extra kind of dimension. He is the global Father of the universe. And in that sense, all of the people in the universe are his natural children. You know, I'm called McNeil because I'm the son of Neil. Well, I'm actually not. I'm the son of Ian. But anyway, that, that was how it originally worked, right? O'Neill, McNeil, whatever. All of us are, by nature, sons of the Father, <laughs> sons of the Lord. So... McLord sounds like something you might get from Maccas, but but, no, but it's it, we are all sons of the Father, and because of that, we get our name, we get who we are, we get our identity. All of that happens because He is our Creator, because He is the one from whom all of us get our name. So that is why we can call Him Father. Now, it's a bit tricky when you say, God is your loving father, because if you've got a really bad father, you say, I don't want a father like the father I've got. But if you can imagine the ultimately ultimate perfect father in every single way, that is the father in heaven, the one from whom you get your name. But what does he pray to the father? Verse 16, we'll pick up pace now. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Uh, before we find out what he's asking for, we, we hear where it comes from. We, we know that God will give us what we need that he's praying for because he's got unlimited resources. God has unlimited resources. His tank never runs out. His bank account never runs dry. He has got unlimited downloads. No matter what, he has got the lot. And so because he can provide everything, and in unlimited quantities, what does Paul want? Well, he prays that the Father would give the Ephesian Christians inner strength through his spirit. Bit of an interesting thing to pray for, isn't it? He prays that they would have inner strength through his spirit. Now, I've got to say that when I'm praying for someone, when I'm praying for you guys and others, I don't think that is what naturally runs off my tongue, that, that you would have inner strength through God's Holy Spirit. I, I can pray. I can think of a whole lot of other things that I pray for, and they're sort of similar, but that's interesting, isn't it? I think it's a really good thing to pray. See, we need electrical power to run our mobile devices. We need... 
uh, you know, petrol power to be able to run our cars. We, we need sugar power to run a marathon. But we need God's Holy Spirit to empower us, to give us inner strength, to be spiritually strong. And that's particularly the case when we face spiritual attacks. We need strength when we face spiritual attacks. And if we think we can stand up on our own, then we're fooling ourselves. We need the Holy Spirit power in our lives so that we will be strong enough to keep going as followers of of Jesus, so that we won't run out of power, so we won't run out of steam, so we won't run out of batteries. But what happens next, I think, is a bit of a surprise. Verse 17a. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Now, what's so surprising about that? Well, I think what's surprising about that is that Paul already reckons that the Ephesians are friends with Jesus. And then he prays that Christ would make his home in their hearts. You'd say, well, how does that work? Doesn't he already live in their hearts? That's a bit weird. So what's he praying? Well, I remember hearing theologian Don Carson talk about this particular verse a long time ago. I didn't double check it this week, but it it sort of struck something. This whole, the the illustration I'm about to give really connected with what I was, with my mind, I can remember it. He basically said it's kind of like when you move into a new house. So you pick up the keys from the real estate agent and you, you turn up and you unlock the door and the place is empty. And then the removalists arrive or you turn up and you get the stuff out of your car or your truck or whatever and you move all the boxes in and then you move the furniture in and then it's, it's sort of there and it's in the house and, and when people say to you, so where do you live? You say, oh, I, li- I live in, in um, you know, Dapta. Oh, no, 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 I, I live in Oak Flat. Oh, no, no, I live anything. It takes a while for you to say, no, I live in Jamboree. That's because you're sort of moving in in a sense. And then you start to unpack all the boxes bit by bit. If you're like Mandy, you've unpacked them all within 24 hours. They're all gone. You, but for others, it's sort of like you might sometimes have some stuff in your garage that's still in boxes and you'll just take it from next house to the next. Oh, we did that. We, we, we're never allowed to do that in our house. But we, it takes a while to finally move in. So it's fully, I mean, it's, you're in your house and you've got your stuff there, but you haven't really moved in yet. You're not really at home, home there yet. And I think that's what, well, that's certainly what Don Carson reckons is the case, and he's pretty smart. I think he's right, that it's saying that, that Christ will really dwell, that, that, that he'll really be in your home, in your heart, uh, that, that he'll be in every single room of your house, that, that he'll really be there and not just sort of in the living room and not in the bedroom and not in the bathroom and not in the spare room and not in the garage and not in the playroom, and that he'll be everywhere. And that happens when you've got the Holy Spirit's strength to do that. Essentially, Paul is praying that Jesus would be more in our life. Now, for some of you, you've only been followers of Jesus for a short period of time. Some of you have been followers of Jesus for a long time. Regardless, we are all, I'm still praying for myself, that God, that Jesus would actually settle in more and more and more to those areas of my life where I'm sinning to those areas of my life where I worship myself, not Jesus, where I have my idols that I think are actually more important than loving Jesus. And I pray, and I pray that you pray for me, that Jesus would sort of stretch out his wings just a bit more in my life. It's a great thing to be praying for. But how does it happen? What happens as you trust in him? Quite literally, by our faith. As we trust him in the tough times, that's when Jesus takes more space in our house, to use that expression. It's when we're scared about our health and we pray to Jesus, I'm feeling scared. And we trust in him, we say, I know that you are trustworthy. It's like you unpack another Jesus box in your house. (laughs) Or your employment. The whole COVID thing's hit. You know, you might be in an industry that's really, really busy right now. You might be in in an industry that is really, really not busy right now. Anxious. We're in the first recession in a really long time. You trust in Jesus and he unpacks another box in your house. Or in your relationships. There are those people that you just don't want to bump into in the shops. Or it might even be that they live in the house with you and you 
just don't want to get deep with them and you don't want to touch on those certain issues that are painful and you just sort of scoot around them. And in those times of difficulty and anxiety, you pray to Jesus, say, Jesus, I trust you in these difficult times. And he unpacks another box. It's by trusting him in those difficult times that he really dwells more in our lives. And this happens through prayer. But something else happens as well, 17b. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. It's sort of like a drought-proof plant. You know, there's ones you see a garden and a whole lot of plants have withered because it's hot and it's dry. And then there's these other ones that are really, really green, usually the weeds. <laughs> but uh, I th- Well, I, I don't know if it's... A, well, technically it's a noxious weed, but it's the only thing that's green in my house at the moment. Okay, we'll keep it, right? That's fine. Uh, but you, you know these plants last because they, their roots go down low, 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 low. Or those trees that, that have the massive winds come and you see them bending over and over and over in the wind and the cyclones that hit us and yet they bounce back. Why? Because their roots go down. The roots go down and they keep them strong. Now our roots will go down where? What is, where is it to our, to our roots? Go down to the water, the well of the, the spirit, the living water of Jesus? Well, that would kind of be a nice analogy. It would fit in that sense. But actually, no, it's, it's saying going down into God's love. Our roots go down to God's love. You, see, you might say that if you're feeling a bit wobbly as a follower of Jesus, that you might need to be drawing in on the knowledge. Tell us more about, 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 about what God's character is like. Or maybe more about the hope in the future or all these sorts of things. But the thing that is powering them, the things that the the roots are going deep down into, is God's love. It's a bit surprising, really. I wouldn't have picked that. But we are powered, we are strengthened by God's love. And this love keeps us strong like a big tree with big roots. But not everybody gets God's love. Not everybody naturally understands it. In fact, even followers of Jesus don't fully understand his love. And the only way that we'll have any chance of getting our head around his love is that we get more power. This is this power prayer, isn't it? We need more power. Have a look. Verse 18. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. What's God's love like? God's love is truly mind-blowing. It is extraordinarily huge. You think of the size of the universe. You think of how long it takes to get in a rocket and fly to the moon. And then how long it takes to go to the nearest star. It's And you do your sums, this is a big place. God's love is bigger. And as we understand his love, Paul is praying specifically that we might experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. It's a lovely translation, actually. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Uh, A slightly more literal one is, uh, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. (laughs) It's kind of, to know what you can't really know. Yeah, well, that's kind of right. It's too great to understand fully. I can't really understand the love of Christ, especially the love that sent him to the cross, especially the love that sent him to die for me while I was his enemy. I can't get my head around that. Just before we had Jemima sing, how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. That that is the love of God that you just can't really fully get your head around. Because ultimately, God's love is too great to fully understand it. If someone said to me, oh, okay, God's love, tick, work that one out. It's like, go and have another look. You sure? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nailed it. Sweet. Next thing, tick. It's like, really? I don't think you've looked hard enough. 
because it is beyond knowing. It is that great. It is too great to fully understand. As we see in so many parts of the scriptures, but in Romans 5, 7 and 8. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who's especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us when we were still sinners. You know, I'd take a bullet for my wife or kids without blinking. And I reckon I'd risk my life for a stranger or a friend if I thought I could save them. But I'd find it really hard to so in a sober and measured way to give my life for someone who hated my guts. And even more for someone who had hurt my family and hated my family and hated me. To then say, I'll die for you. I can't get my head around how anyone could possibly do that. I don't think you can, can you? Because well, if you can, then maybe you can get your head around God's love. I don't think you can. We are just starting to scrape the surface of the love of Jesus. If you are friends with Jesus, that is the cost. The idea of giving his life for you when you hated him, when you by nature rebelled against him, when by nature you wished he was dead. It's not like Jesus, you know, you say to Jesus, I'm really sorry. And he says, yeah, don't worry about it. When he says, I forgive you, he only could do that by dying. It was only by giving his all for you and for me. You reckon you can just get that? Now you're dreaming. This is just a taste of the wow of the love of Christ. But there's another benefit in being amazed by his love, by knowing this unknowable love. Verse 19b. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. When when you know the love of Christ, you get true fulfillment. How many midlife crises would be averted if people just read Ephesians 3.19? You know, I just want more in life. I'm going to buy a a car or, you know, get a different wife or husband or something. It's like, really? You think that's going to work? You want a fulfilled life? You come to Christ. If you're feeling unfulfilled in your life, then you need to pray to God for power to know the love of Christ. And then as you know the love of Christ, which is a spiritual thing that comes from God's power, then you will get fulfillment. Now, I can't tell you that you're going to feel 100% fully fulfilled in every single way this side of heaven. We live in a, a world that is fallen. We live in a world where the devil still tempts us. We live in a world where our flesh drowns us, brings us down and stops us from looking up to God's glory. But I tell you what, if you, if you think you can get that fulfillment somewhere else, you're kidding yourself. Come to Jesus and you won't get a happy life necessarily, but you'll get a fulfilled life. And that is better than anything else. Because, you know, the more you know about the love of Christ, I think the more you're likely to love other people. I think that's what drives us. So when you understand the love of Christ, the costly love of Christ, the love how vast beyond all measure, then you will be motivated to love others. And you'll say, wow, Jesus loves me that much. I reckon in his power, by his spirit, I can love someone else who's unlovable. Well, Paul's prayer turns the final corner and we head into the home straight with the last two verses. Have a look at verse 20. He says, Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. (laughs) He ends his prayer by not pointing to us. Uh -uh. He wants God to have all the glory. It's not about him. It's not about us. And if this prayer really gets answered fully, you know what we'll be talking about? Jesus. You know what we're talking about? The Father. And how will that happen? Through God's power. As as he prays, 
The power of God will help us to know the love of Christ, which will help us to be fulfilled. And as we are fulfilled, God gets the glory. Can you see that chain? All this glory comes from him. And his glory accomplishes more than we'd ever imagined. And we get the final verse, which shows us where this glory will be shown. It says, verse 21, glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Where's the glory to be seen? It's in the church. I talked about the church last week. But it's the miracle that God would take a jerk like me and redeem me as his own. And you, I'm not saying you're a jerk, but you know what I mean? I'm, you know, really, when it comes to God, what, what do you got to offer him? Nothing. What, what should he do to you? Send you to hell. What does he do for you? Saves you. And you're part of his church. And that makes us a miracle that brings glory to God. It's an absolute miracle that even one person follows Jesus on this planet. A miracle that one person would turn from rule, wanting to rule themselves to say, Jesus, I throw you my crown. I cast it at your feet. I want you to be the one that I worship, not myself. That is an utter miracle. Let alone that there'd be two of us. Let alone that there'd be a hundred of us or more at Jamboree. Wow, this is an amazing testimony. And what does it do? Does it say how good are we? How good is the church? It says how good is Jesus? And the glory goes to God. And that's the end of the prayer. That's the end of Paul's prayer time. And we've sat down at the foot of the master as his apprentices, as his trainees. We've sat down and we've listened to the way that he prays. And as we've done so, I hope that you've caught something so that when you pray for the people who are sitting in front of you or behind you or pray for me and I'll pray for you, that we might just catch a bit of this and pray this way. And so with that in mind, let me pray for us. Our Father who created everything in heaven and on earth, we pray that from your glorious unlimited resources that you'll empower us with inner strength through your spirit so that Christ will make his home in our hearts as we trust in him and so that our roots will grow down into your love and keep us strong. We pray that we might have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep your love is. And we pray that we might experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully, so that we will then be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from you. Now all glory to you, who are able, through your mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to you in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for listening to this resource from Jamaroo Anglican Church. For more information, head to jamaroanglican.com.